We're in fit two of um, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Yeah. Fit two Sir, uh, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. This is page 248. And we left off the other day with the Lord with the Lord of the castle um, telling Sir Gallant, you are welcome to do as you please with everything here. All is yours to have and as you wish. Sir Gallant, thanks indeed. <laughs> Christ repay your noblesse. Okay. So, Sir Gallant studies the man, etc., etc. He's big. Notice we're told a great sized knight indeed in the prime of life. Should be a little clue, but you get the impression Sir Gowan may not be all that, you know, quick on the uptake. Broad and glossy beard, reddish brown, stern face, blah, 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 blah. He's got several attendants. Curtains of pure silk line the walls. Um, and the narrator gives us, again, all this detailed description, probably giving us an indication of who the audience is, that the audience is somebody who's going to really appreciate all this. The chair is brought before the fire. They sit down. Sir Gowan eats and such. And I want to pick up with line 903. The conversation goes on, and we are told, by discreet inquiry addressed to that prince, so that he must politely admit he belonged to the court, which noble Arthur, that gracious man, rules alone. Notice Sir Gowan doesn't come in and just say, Hi, I'm Sir Gowan, I sit at you know, the round table with King Arthur, etc. It, it is gently brought out that that's where he's from, and that it was Gowan or Gawain himself who was sitting there. Having arrived there at Christmas, as his fortune chanced. When the lord of the castle heard who was his guest, he laughed loudly at the news, so deeply was he pleased. And all the men in the castle were overjoyed to make the acquaintance, acquaintance quickly then of the man to whom all excellence and valor belongs, whose refined manners are everywhere praised. Okay, remember, what does Gowan have on the front of the shield? The star, what does it represent? The five fives. The five fives are telling us Sir Gowan is what, essentially? Christian. Okay, yeah, he's Christian. He's perfect. He's perfect. He's perfect in his five senses. He's perfect in his five fingers. He has perfect faith in the five wounds of Christ and in Mary's five joys. And then he's got those five, you know, qualities or virtues. Compassion, love of fellow man, generosity, etc., etc. Okay? He's perfect. So, they all now know who he is, and the narrator tells us they all believe that he is the man to whom all excellence and valor belongs, whose refined manners are everywhere praised, and whose fame exceeds any other persons on earth. Notice, this isn't Sir Gowan saying this about himself. The narrator is saying this about everybody else and what they think of Sir Gowan. And this is long before you get the modern abomination of the you know, uh, unreliable narrator. Narrators at this time are reliable. They're telling you what they believe to be the truth. And they're not lying to us. This isn't um, Bartleby the Scrivener, okay? So, each knight whispers to his companion, we got Sir Gowan here. What does that mean? 916, now we shall enjoy seeing displays of good manners and the irreproachable terms of noble speech, the art of conversation we can learn unasked since we have taken in the source of good breeding. Why is this important? Where are they? Geographically. Northwestern England. Okay. 
in the time in which the poem is written, not in which the poem is said, but the time in which the poem is written, where is the cultural center of England? London. Okay. This is way up here. What's the cultural center of the United States? D.C. or New York or maybe Hollywood. And if it's Hollywood, that says a lot. It ain't Woodbury. This is Woodbury. Sorry for those of you who are from Woodbury. I'm not, you know, <laughs> sliding you anything. This is backwoods. This is provincial. This is about as far away from London as you can get and still be in England. I mean, in one sense, literally. It's, it's pretty close to the border of Wales and to the border of Scotland. Okay? So, when they say, now we shall enjoy seeing this, this is kind of like, now we're going to hear all kinds of good speech. He talks real good. And we can learn good speech notice without having to ask. He will simply model the art of conversation. The art of conversation doesn't just mean he speaks grammatically correct English. Nobody does, by the way. Right? It means how to carry on a conversation because that not everybody really knows how to do very well since we have taken in the source of good breeding does this mean you know wherever Sir Gowan goes he breeds <laughs> that's kind of what it implies he is of good okay he is of good breeding but what else it's even more than that even though they were unaware of these ideas when this poem is written, especially probably in the area around Chester, this is like, like the platonic idea of ideals. He is the model from which all others are copies of good breeding. Okay? Truly, God has been gracious to us indeed in allowing us to receive such a guest as Gawain, whose birth men will happily sit down and celebrate in song. What day is it? Christmas. It's Christmas. Whose birth ought they be celebrating in song? Yeah, not Sir Gallant's. Okay. In knowledge of fine manners, this man has expertise. I think that those who hear him will learn, ah, what love talk is. Well, shoot, we're going to learn how to talk to the women folk from him. He will teach us about that kind of conversation. Okay? So, dinner's finished. Time had almost drawn on tonight. Chaplains made their way to the castle chapel, rang their bells so that people can go to the church too. Sir Gowan goes, smartly dressed, quickly arrives. Lord takes him by the sleeve, leads him to a seat, greets him familiarly, but I hate that word, <laughs> calling him by his name, then said, you're, you're the welcomest guest in the world. Sir Gowan thanks him, the two men embrace, and then we're told, 941, then the lady wished to set eyes on the knight and left her pew with many fair women. Let's see. Yeah, the Middle English isn't pew. She left her closet. Okay? And that's because in some castles, in the little chapels, you have within the little chapels, like almost little rooms where certain people would sit. There would be essentially walls, not walls to the ceiling, but walls maybe five, six feet tall that would separate. One of the reasons for that is less distraction. It kind of like is like a horse with blinders on. It enables you only to see what's ahead. Okay? So she has heard about Sir Gowan, but she can't see him. Why? She's not in a pew, modern construction. She is in this little kind of walled off area. So she gets up. We're told, 943, she was the loveliest on earth in complexion and features, in figure, in coloring, and behavior above all others. 
This is not the same person who comes to Lonval in Lonval, because that is the queen of the fairies. Okay? This one isn't a fairy. And more beautiful than Guinevere, it seemed to the knight. Anytime you get, and she's more beautiful than Guinevere, you know trouble is coming down the road. <laughs> she came through the chancel to greet him courteously with another lady leading her by the left hand. Now, the other lady leading her by the left hand is the beautiful one holding the other lady by her, the beautiful one's left hand. So the, the other woman's in front of her, and the beautiful one has her hand out like this. Or is it the other lady whose left hand is being held out to lead the beautiful lady? Because she wouldn't, it, it's not they're both walking by left hand, because that's just awkward. So one's being held by the right hand, the other one by the left hand. The reason I ask is this is a pretty important question. What is, here it is, what is left in Latin? Sinister. Sinister. Sinistre. Okay. So, two women. This one, loveliest on earth, prettier than Guinevere. She came through the chancel with the other one leading her by the left hand. Who was older than she? All right. An aged one, it seems. Okay, so she's not just older. Because, you know, you can be a year older and still be pretty hot. But this one's not hot by any means. And respectfully treated by the assembled knights. Why? <coughs> well, she's older. Treat your elders with respect. Why else, jump to the end of the poem, might she be treated with respect by the knights? Who is this old lady? Morgana. Morgana. Morgan Le Fay. That is, Morgan the Fay. Fay there can mean terrible. It can also mean not really quite of this world, fairy-ish kind of world. Why might the assembled knights respectfully treat her? Because she'll turn you into a frog if you don't, you know. But very different in looks were the two ladies. <coughs> For where the young one was fresh, the other was withered. Every part of that one, the young one, rosily aglow. It's like the inner nightlight in her has been turned on. And she just and she just casts the light wherever she goes. On the other, rough, wrinkled cheeks hung in folds. This is the human Sharpe. If you know what a Sharpe dog looks like, just you know, one wrinkle after another. Many bright pearls adorn the kerchiefs of one whose breast and white throat uncovered. And it doesn't mean she's walking around with her breast hanging out. It just means she's got a low cut down on. And the men are going, mm, mm, mm. Sean more dazzling than snow, new fallen on hills. Again, the emphasis is here is on what is the model of beauty. And it is pure whiteness. Right? The other wore a gorget <laughs> over her neck. She's all wrapped up which is probably good, because if her cheeks are full of wrinkles, you can imagine her neck is just, you know, like a lizard. I mean, just saggy. Her swarthy chin wrapped in chalk white veils. Swarthy. What does that mean? It's like dark. Dark. Usually people of Middle Eastern descent are called swarthy, not one phase, <laughs> or women of England. What might it imply? Like she's like old because she has hair growing out of her chin. If any of you, you know, grew up listening, watching to new people who watch Veggie Tales, you know, it's, you know, Aunt Ruth has a beard. Kind of like that, possibly. Okay? So, 
Her forehead enfolded in silk, muffled up everywhere with embroidered hems and lattice work of tiny stitching, so that nothing was exposed of her but her black brows. So all you can really see of her face is her eyes, her eyebrows, her nose, and her mouth. Everything else covered up. Why? Like a nun. But she's not a nun by any means. Which were repulsive, her eyes, nose, and naked lips, were repulsive to see and shockingly bleared. Probably her eyes, not her lips. So bleary-eyed, watery, filmy, milky, you, yeah, gross. A noble lady, indeed, you might call her by God. And then the poet just kind of, you know, pulls out all the stops. He wants to make sure we get the full image. With body squat and thick. Squat, I think, means low to the ground and wide. And buttocks bulging broad. Kim Kardashian, you know. Disgusting, in my opinion, but. More delectable in looks was the lady whom she led. Notice he, he doesn't really need to say anything else there. You get this one compared to this one, and frankly, this one could be not all that attractive. But compared to this one, a goddess. <laughs> Gawain glanced at the beauty who favored him with the look. That's kind of a... Mm. <laughs> and taking leave of the Lord, he walked towards them. Well, what was he told the first night when he got there? You can have everything here. It's all yours. Do with it as you will. The older one, he salutes with a deep bow. He goes up to her and bows to her, respecting her. Does he know who she is? Not a clue. He's honoring her age <clears throat> and takes the lovelier one briefly into his arms, kisses her respectfully and courteously speaks. Now, I don't know about you, but with the whole Me Too movement and everything, but takes her into his arms and kisses her. Does that mean he just gently goes up and does this? Or, as some commentators kind of suggest, he takes her and does this. Okay. Notice she doesn't protest. They ask to make his acquaintance. He quickly begs truly to be their servant. Courtly love. He's saying, I am yours to command. I'm your vassal. If that would please them. They place him between them and lead him, still chatting. So... They place him between them, still leading. So now is the old one in front, Sir Gowan's holding her hand, he's holding the lady's hand. Weird, however you think of it. And they go to a private room to the fireplace. They call for spice cakes, which men bring to them. They drink with wine. The Lord jumps up politely several occasions. He urges his guests to make merry. And he says, um, let's see here, <laughs> Sir Gallon amused with games the whole night long. Um, <coughs> line 1000, the next day comes, more feasting, ancient lady sits in the place of honor, line 101, the Lord politely taking his place by her, I believe, Gawain and the lovely lady were seated together, right in the middle of the table. Um, let's see here. 1035, skipping a bit again. The Lord says, Indeed, sir, as long as I live, I shall be the better, because Gawain was my guest at God's own feast. I will be better off for the rest of my life, and I will have a better reputation, because everybody will know that Sir Gowan ain't here. I mean, if this were modern-day London, he'd be saying, I'm going to get a blue plaque on the side of my wall. 
there, you got these blue plaques all over London because so and so ate there, so and so lived there, so and so died there. You know, this is where Jimi Hendrix died, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, he's saying it's merely because you graced my hall, Sir Gallon. Ah, oh, shucks. <laughs> In truth, it is yours as the honor falls to you, and may the High King, that's God, not Arthur, repay you. I am at your commandment to act on your bidding as I am duty-bound to in everything large or small by right. In other words, when I'm under your roof in your hall, I serve you. You are my Lord and King while I am here. Okay. So the Lord tries to get Sir Gowan to extend his stay. He kind of says he can't and says, why? Line 1050 and following, he says, I've got to go find the green chapel wherever it stands upon earth, 1057, or 1058, and of a night he maintains it was colored green. All right? So he says, I have to leave. Uh, in fact, in three days, I've, I've got to meet this green knight. And the Lord laughs and says, no problem. You can stay. I'll direct you at your meeting at the year's end. Let the whereabouts of the Green Chapel worry you no more, for you shall lie in your beds or taking your ease until late in the day. That is, late in the day when you're supposed to meet the Green Knight. Why? Chapel's only two miles. Be there in 30 minutes. <laughs> then Sir Gowan was overjoyed. Why? Because he's thinking, Phew, I don't have to go back out into the wild. Where he's been fighting boars, bulls, bears, ogres, wild <laughs> men. Line 1080. Now I thank you heartily for this above everything else. Now my quest is accomplished. I sh hmm. My quest is accomplished. No. <laughs> not quite. His quest will be accomplished what? When he takes a return stroke. Not necessarily when he dies, though he thinks he's going to die. So the host takes him, bids the ladies be fetched to increase their delight. I'm not really sure what that means. And they had great, great pleasure by themselves in private, etc., etc. So the Lord, 1089, you've agreed to carry out whatever deed I ask. Will you keep this promise now at this very instant? Okay. What does he mean? You've promised to do whatever I say. Will you do it right now? Sir Gallon, while I'm under your roof, I obey your bidding. He says, okay, you've traveled far, you've wearied yourself, you've reveled all night with me, you've not recovered yet. Here's what we'll do. Tomorrow morning, you stay in your bed, you, you sleep all day long if you want. Till mass time at least, then you get up and go to church. Meanwhile, I'm going to go out and hunt. Excuse me. Till mass time, then you go to, go to dine. When you like, with my wife, we'll sit at your side and be your charming companion. I will rise at dawn and go hunting. And Sir Gowan's like, okay, that's cool. Hold on there. Not done yet. Let's make an agreement. Whatever I catch in the wood, I will give to you. Whatever you catch here, you give to me. Cool? Cool. All right. By God, I agree to that. Your love of, of amusement pleases me much. Bring us a drink and let's agree on it. Because, you know, you can't have an agreement without a beer. So, they drink and they agree. Part three, or fit three. Okay, so what have we seen? The poem opens with what? The beheading game. Okay? Now, so this is the first thing. Now, we're going to have the exchange of winnings game. Okay? A third <coughs> game is going to be introduced. The third game is related to the exchange of winnings game. 
What do you want to call this third game? How about the temptation game? Okay. All three are related. They're all intertwined. And all three are not unique to Sagan and the Green Knight. These are motifs that you see throughout folklore. All right. So, next morning, part three, household awakes. Guests who are leaving, notice Sagan's not the only guest there. Guests who are leaving call for their grooms, they get their horses, they go off. The Lord goes off with his huntsmen and they hunt. Meanwhile, line 1179, meanwhile, back at the castle, lying snug while the daylight gleamed on the walls under a splendid co excuse me, coverlet shut in by curtains. And as he lazily dozed, he heard slyly made a little noise at his door. And it stealthily opened. He raised up his head from the bedclothes, lifts a corner of the curtain because he's in a big four poster bed that has curtains around it. Why? Because if you've ever been in a castle in England or North Scotland, those suckers are cold during the winter. Because that stone just what? Acts like a heat sink, which in the winter acts like a ice sink. That is, it takes all the coldness, and the coldness just stays. So you surround your bed with curtains, also because they're drafty. Okay? So he's lying in bed. He hears a noise at the door. He hears a... Lifts his head up, pulls the curtain, and he sees over at the door. It was the lady looking her lovely who shut the door after her carefully so that it didn't make that sound. <laughs> it came towards the bed. The knight felt confused. Yeah, I'll bet he did. And lay down again cautiously, pretending to sleep. That is, he lets the curtain go. He gets back down. He probably pulls the covers up almost over his head. And she approached silently, stealing to his bed, lifted the bed curtain, and crept within. No, 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 you don't do that, okay? And seating herself softly on the bedside, waited there strangely long to see when he <laughs> would wait. Now, this is creepy. <laughs> she comes, he's lying here, and she just does this. <laughs> and bear in mind, he's wide awake. She's not aware that he's wide awake. And he waits there for a while, and he kind of thinks it would be more fitting to discover straight away by talking what she wants. So he wakes up, opens his eyes, pretends surprise, crosses himself, as if by prayer and this sign, or as if protecting himself. Okay? This would also be the quote-unquote Common thing for a Christian to do in the morning, in the Middle Ages. First thing you do, you cross yourself. Why? You didn't die in your sleep. Thank God I'm awake. Okay? It's the last thing to do when you go to sleep. And he sees her with lovely chin and cheek, a blended color bow. Charmingly she spoke, and she says, Good morning, Sir Gowan. You are an unwary sleeper that one can steal in here. Now you are caught in a moment. Unless we agree on a truce, I shall imprison you in your bed. Yeah, Freud would just, you know, <laughs> blow his mind, okay? Imprison you. She's probably talking about, so she's sitting here like this, and he's lying here. She reaches down, pins his shoulders or his arms, so now she's <laughs> leaning over him. Pinned, imprisoned. And he says, good morning, you shall do with me as you wish, and that pleases me much. I'm yours. I'm here. <laughs> for I surrender at once and beg for your mercy. Language of chivalry, begging for mercy, but also the language of courtly love. 
Chivalry and courtly love are not synonymous. They're not the same thing. They're not necessarily antithetical. They can be at points, however. Okay? I beg for your mercy, and that is best in my judgment, for I simply must. Thus he jokes in turn. In other words, why is he joking? The narrator seems to be saying when he says, I surrender, I'm yours, you can do with me as you please, that's a joke. She's not taking it jokingly. But if you would grant me leave, release your captive, ask him to rise, I would get out of this bed and put on proper dress and then take more pleasure in talking with you. She goes, oh, no, 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 no. Indeed not, good sir. Why? You shall not leave your bed. I intend something better. And at this point, I imagine he probably, even though he doesn't physically do it, because we're not given the description, mentally he's going, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the name of the Father, Son, and he's crossing himself, you know, mentally. I shall tuck you in here on both sides of the bed. And that's when she physically pins him. For I know well in truth that you are Sir Gawain whom everyone reveres wherever you go. Your good name and courtesy, honorably praised by lords, by ladies, everybody, all folk alive. And now you're here, and you're alone. My husband and his men, way the hell out of there. They're gone. Other servants are in bed. My women, too. The door is shut and locked. Nobody can get in. And I have under my roof the man everyone loves. I shall spend my time well while it lasts with talk. And he's probably going, you are welcome to me indeed. What's she saying? Take me. I'm yours. That's what you are welcome to me means. She's not saying you're welcome. Like he said, thank you. You're welcome. Amelia? Like if you were to like make this a movie right now, and like the, that when she says like with talk, it would be like very sarcastic. Oh, and yeah. Like with talk. Like quote, quotation marks. You know? Because like that's not at all what she's saying. I would have loved to see the Monty, Pyth Monty Python gang <laughs> do this. <laughs> it would, yeah. Well, it wouldn't be, probably wouldn't be R. It'd probably have to be X <laughs> with them. You are welcome to me indeed. Take whatever you want. Words, that is, we can just talk, or we can do a little more than talk. Circumstances force me to be your servant. Okay. Huh. Well, he's already said, I'm your servant. So now she says, I'm your servant. Is this like, you know, the old Chippendale cartoons? No, no, you first. No, 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 you first. No, no. I'm your servant. You're my, so we're both servants. So neither of us can take command. I, truly, I'm greatly honored. I, oh, oh, you think I'm that Sir Gowan? No, 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 no. I am not, in fact, such a man as you speak of. To deserve such respect as you have just described, I am completely unworthy. I know very well. I should be happy indeed if you thought it proper that I might devote myself by words or by deed to giving you pleasure. It would be a great joy. Okay, he should have stopped with words. I could give you great pleasure with words. I could sing to you. I could read you a tale. I could create poetry for you. But he has to throw in deeds. Deeds is not words. Okay? And she says, in all truth, if the excellence and gallantry everyone admires, I were to slight or disparage, that would hardly be courteous. If I were to deny you the glory and reputation that you have, I would be violating the courtly tradition. We can't have that. Now can we? No, no. She says... A great many ladies would rather now hold you, sir, in their power as I have you here. Okay, so let's follow Amelia's line. 
And imagine we're filming this. Who plays Sir Gallon? Names, somebody. Chris Pratt. That's a Gerard Butler. Gerard Butler. Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> you know, I've heard people say, you know, Chris Evans, Hemsworth, any one of the Hemsworths, except for the fat accountant brother who's nobody knows. <laughs> um, okay. Tom Hiddleston, yeah, one of my daughters would go, Tom Hiddleston, yeah. yeah. Okay. Little Finn, Gerard Butler would be good because of the accent, I mean, he would just, you know, nail it, okay? So, she says, a great many ladies, what does she mean, a great many ladies? Any woman in the world would want to be where I am right now. <laughs> And probably with almost any one of those men we've mentioned, almost anyone in the, any woman in the world, and probably a lot of men too, would say, yep. <laughs> to spend time amusingly with your charming talk. Now, I imagine an awful lot of women would just want to be able to talk to Tom Hiddleston or Gerard Butler or any of those guys, just to be in the same room and breathe the same air probably. Okay? <laughs> Delighting themselves, forgetting their cares than much of the treasure or wealth they possess. They would rather be with you than all the wealth they have. But I praise that same Lord who holds up the heavens. I have complete, that's God. She's not saying you, Sir Gallon, you hold up the heavens. <laughs> I praise God that I have completely in my grasp the man everyone longs for through God's grace. In my grasp. Why? She's got them pinned. You're mine, buddy. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Radiant with loveliness, great favor she conferred. In other words, she's doing what? Kill. Yeah. How? She's pulling out all the stops. I mean, the pheromones are just, you know, out of her. Okay? The knight with virtuous speech answered her every word. What's the original meaning of the word answer? A-N-S-W-E-R. And sword. S-W-O-R-D. An answer is a parrying with a sword. You are blocking and deflecting. You are protecting yourself. Notice he, with virtuous speech, kind of deflects everything. Why is it with virtuous speech? Why doesn't he say, out of my bed, foul whore? Courtly love. Courtly love. Chivalry. You don't speak to a woman that way, even if she is a foul whore. Guinevere. <laughs> I mean, Lanval comes close to it. And look what happens to him. <laughs> Lady, he says, may Mary repay you. Okay. So it's now it's like they're playing poker. She thanks God. She puts a five-pound note in. And he says, may Mary repay you. And he throws in a tenner. <laughs> He's upping the, ant, the, the, um, the Christian ante. <laughs> for I have truly made proof of your great generosity and many other folk win credit for their deeds. He's saying, I haven't done anything. I haven't done anything to earn your credit. But the respect shown to me is not at all my deserving. Again, give Sir Gowan a shovel and he's going to dig a hole big enough to get himself into and not out of. Because what's he talking about? Deeds. And she's probably going, just hold on there, big boy. <laughs> we'll get to deeds in a moment. Amelia? No, no, that's two days later. Oh, okay. This three days later, okay? okay. The night, the night before, the night said, "No, no, don't worry about that. You've got three days. You can get up late in the afternoon and go there." That this is the first. It's two days later because he is going to, he is going to wake up and she's going to be there again the third morning. Okay, so 
He says that honor is due to yourself who know nothing but good. That is, you are giving me this credit and this honor. Why? Because you are so full of honor. And so full of hope. <coughs> By Mary. Then in other words, I see you're Mary. And I raise you a Mary. To me, it seems very different. For if I were the worthiest of all women alive and held all the riches of the earth in my hand and could bargain and pick a lord for myself, that is, if I could pick any famous actor or whoever, for the virtues I have seen in you, Sir Knight, here. But what virtues? Good looks, courtesy, charming manner. Good looks. Is that really a virtue? Did, did Tom Hiddleston or Gerard Butler or Chris Evans or Chris Pratt or any of the Hemsworth boys, except for the ugly fat one, you know, <laughs> did any of them really have to do anything to look the way they do, other than maybe if they've done plastic surgery? Nope. That's genes. They were born that way. Okay, Hemsworth, you know, yeah, he had to work out a lot. Okay. Tom Hiddleston hasn't hit the gym nearly as much as a Thor has, you know. Loki's kind of puny and wimpy compared to Thor. So, she says, your looks are virtuous. Your courtesy, well, that is. Courtesy is entirely what? It's behavior. Behavior can be virtuous, and it can be full of vice. In charming manner. In other words, I like how you talk. You talk nice. You talk real good. <laughs> All that I have previously heard, your reputation that has preceded you, and now know to be true. We've heard about you before, and she says, and now I've just tested you. She doesn't use that language, but no man on earth would be picked before you. If you're it, man. You're it. No man on earth. Well, who does that no man on earth obviously include? Her husband who's out, you know, hunting, which could be dangerous in the Middle Ages, depending on what he hunts for. This day, however, we're going to find out what does he hunt. He kills Bambi. Okay? It's a deer. The next day he's going to go hunting again. What did he kill that day? Exchange of winnings. So you have day one, day two, day three. We have a deer is killed. What does Sir Gowan win that first day? A kiss. A kiss. Second day, the knight goes hunting. What does he hunt? A boar. A wild boar in the Middle Ages that is killed with spears and swords. This is not a uh, easy thing to do. This is not something you just do for sport. Why? Boars can regularly and easily kill you because wild boars we're talking here, this time period, are at the shoulder as tall or taller than I am with tusks that gut horses. Okay? What's he get? Another kiss. Maybe a deeper, longer, wetter, sloppier kiss, but yeah. <laughs> Third day? A fox. A cute little fox. How dangerous are foxes if you're hunting? They're not. What do they do? I mean, foxes are how big? They're, you know, snout to tail. Maybe like this. Snout to rear end, like this. Like a large cat or a small dog. You know, and they don't attack people. They attack chickens, True. maybe cats, other birds, fowl, etc. They don't attack, they run. They kill so little, helpless, defenseless fox. What's he get? Ah, we'll talk about that, okay? So, he says, no, 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 you've chosen much better. In other words, you're a lord boy. He's a, he's a man's man, yeah. 
I am proud of that esteem you hold me in, but in all that gra in all gravity, your servant, my sovereign, I consider you. Your sir, I am your servant, you are my sovereign. By saying that, what is he telling her? I'm yours. Do with me as you please. And declare myself your knight. And he puts the icing on the cake as protection. And may Christ reward you. And don't do anything Christ wouldn't want you to do. That's what the import of those words is. So they chat of this and that until late morning. And always the lady behaved as if loving him much. The knight reacts cautiously in the most courteous of ways. That is, he never says, uh, 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 over the lines there, lady. He always responds courteously. <coughs> though she was the loveliest woman he could remember. Why, though? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's going through his mind? I'm alone with her, and her husband's way out there. And he said, he said, use anything you want. It's all yours. But it's kind of like there's this unwritten rule, but not that. <laughs> he felt small interest in love because of the, ah. Even though he's got the most beautiful woman in the world on his bed with him, his mind is where? He's thinking of a big guy <laughs> who's going to lop his head off to stand a crushing blow and helpless suffering. So I'm leaving then, she spoke, the night agreed. I know that, yeah, yeah, you can leave. Go ahead. As much as he's attracted, he's thinking of that. She bade him goodbye, glanced at him and laughed. She stood astonished. As she stood, astonished him with a forceful rebuke. May he who prospers each speech repay you this pleasure. But you should, I, I don't think you are Sir Gawain. He's like, whoa, 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 what did I do? Why? What does he immediately think? I've done something discourteous. I violated the laws of courtly, excuse me, courtly tradition. Okay? But the lady said, bless you for this, you know, bless your heart. <laughs> So good a knight as Gawain is rightly reputed, and in courtesy is so completely embodied, could not easily have spent so much time with a lady without begging a kiss to comply with politeness. It's polite. By some hint or suggestion at the end of a remark. Then he said, well, let it be as you wish. In other words, you want to kiss? Fine. I will kiss at your bidding as befits a knight. But he doesn't stop there. And do more. Rather than displease you, so urge it no further. You want to kiss? I'll kiss. And I'll do more than that. As long as I don't displease you, so don't urge we go any further than that. I will, I will do whatever I need to do to please you. Please don't go there, <laughs> is what he's saying. With that, she approaches him, takes him in her arms, stoops graciously over him, and kisses him. They commit each other to Christ's keeping. She goes out of the room. He prepares, gets up quickly, calls for his chamberlain, makes his way contentedly to Mass, then goes to his meal, etc. Meanwhile, out in the forest, Bambi's getting slaughtered. Okay, So... And how do we see Bambi get slaughtered? Do we merely hear, and the knight finds a deer, and he kills it, and they go back to the castle? No, we get all the details of the killing, and the killing, and the gutting, and the skinning, etc. Okay? Why? Probably because the audience is familiar with this. A peasant audience wouldn't be familiar with this. Why not? Louder? They don't, hunt. they don't hunt. Well, they might hunt some. But not like in a big party with deer and, to get deer. They and the hunt. king, because the deer belong to the king. Period. 
They can hunt rabbit, <laughs> but not deer. So the knight comes back and says, um, shows Sir Gallon the deer and everything. He says, it's all yours. Told you, whatever I get, it's yours. Sir Gallon. Cool. And what, of, what I have honorably won inside this castle, 1386, with as much goodwill truly shall be yours. And he takes the other strong neck in his arms and kisses him as pleasantly as he can devise. And I think this is full on the lips, man. He just grabs him and, and the knight goes, huh. <laughs> um, well, 1393, it could be even better if you informed me where you won this same prize. In other words, who gave you that kiss? Uh, not part of the agreement. Okay, okay. So, the knight says, let's do it again. This is fun. <laughs> Tomorrow I'll go hunting and you stay here and lounge around and see whatever it is you win. So, they do. This time they hunt a boar. Meanwhile, 1469, our gracious knight lies in his bed, happily at home amid bright colored bedding. Nor did the lady fail to wish her guest good day. Early she was there, his mood to mollify. What does mollify mean? Make pleasant. Well, is he moody? Is he grumpy? Why does he need to be mollified? Because he two days now, he's going to die. So she wants to make his last couple of days good ones. She comes to the curtain, peeps in at the night. Sir Gallon welcomes her politely at once, returns his greeting with eager speech, seats herself at his side, quickly laughs. And she goes, well, I was, you aren't Sir Gallon, because if you had been, I taught you a lesson yesterday, and you apparently haven't learned. He goes, oh, you want to kiss, okay. You have quickly forgotten, 1485, what I taught you yesterday. And he says, well, I, I told you about kissing, to act quickly wherever a glance of favor is seen. Notice, this is the old, you know, war between the sexes, so to speak. What does she say? I gave you a glance. And he's like, huh? You know, he's what? He's your typical male. Clueless, dense, make it clear, okay? Dear lady, enough of such talk. I dare not do that lest I were refused. You know, Harvey Weinstein should have read this once or twice in his life. <laughs> lest I were refused. If repulsed, I should be at fault for having presumed. <laughs> She's like, ha! Ma foi. My faith. Nobody could refuse you. Okay. In the current, you know, cultural climate, this is what? She's saying, no, no, take me. <laughs> Force me. You could not be refused. You are strong enough to force your will if you wish. If any woman were so ill-mannered as to reject you, and Christina's back to going, no! <laughs> it's like, you're setting women's rights back 10,000 years, you know? You're not only hotter than hot, you're massively strong. You could take Whoever, and if she were so ill-mannered to refuse you, she's essentially saying she would get what she deserves. Ouch. <laughs> Sir Gowan, you're right. <laughs> you're right. What you say is quite true. Oh my God. What's he, is he saying that the person who refused me would have to be ill-mannered because I'm me after all? <laughs> Like he is He's saying, I am physically stronger than you. You know, and apparently in our day and age, that is, you know, an idea that some people have problems with. 
There was a, a um, I'm going to go off on my soapbox here for a minute. There was a thing in Portland a couple weeks ago, a talk being held by a, no, not you, Siri, um, <laughs> going on about differences between men and women. Okay? A couple of biologists were speakers at the event. James Damore, the guy at Google, you know, who wrote the infamous Google letter, was there, etc. And one of the biologists speaking, a woman, who used to be at Evergreen State College in Washington and resigned after all the stuff that happened there last year, she started to talk about some basic sex differences between men and women, other than the basic sex difference. You know, men on average are taller than women. And a group of students in the back stood up and started yelling. And she was like, no, I understand that you might not like that, but it is a fact. And the students walked out, trashed the sound system, and then, I mean, this is all on video. I mean, you can watch this. It's hilarious in one sense. <laughs> you know, they're going out and they're calling her biologist, PhD, published, brainwashed. Because she acknowledges physical differences between men and women. Why? Because the physical differences don't fit their ideology. Their ideology is in conflict with reality. What does that mean eventually is going to happen to those poor students? They're going to do this. At some point, they are going to bump into reality, and it's going to be extremely painful for them. Yeah, it's exactly, I mean, it's a lot of it's what, what Jordan Peterson is talking about. Because he's talking about psychological things that are different between men and women that have been conclusively proven. Conclusive. I mean, there are studies left and right. Okay? So he is saying, yeah, you're right. I could take you if I wanted to. He said, but in my country, in other words, at Camelot, force is considered ignoble and so is each gift that is not freely given in other words for a man to force himself on a woman is not right it's what the wife of bath's tale is about a knight of the round table goes off one day sees a beautiful young lady in the woods and rapes her okay word is brought back to guinevere and she says Unless you can answer this question for me, within a year and a day, you will die. What's the question? What do women want? They don't want that. <laughs> and he's like, oh, okay, I'll find that out. We'll talk about that later. So, he says, so is each gift not freely given. In other words, if you want more than kisses, or if you want kisses from me, what? He's watched Hitch. She's got to come 90% of the way. She's got to show this is what she really wants. In fact, he's probably saying you got to come 99. I'll stay here and I'll do this. I'll move an inch. You come. I am at your disposal to kiss when it pleases you. You may take one when you like and stop as seems good in a while. In other words, any puck puckers up. He kind of becomes like a mannequin <laughs> or a sex doll for her to practice on. He says, I'll just, I'll stay here. <laughs> here I am. I'm not leaving, not going anywhere. Just stop when you're done. <laughs> she bends down over him and gives him, gives the night a kiss. And for long they then discuss love's misery and bliss. Why love's misery and bliss? Why love's misery before bliss? Louder? She's with someone else. She's with someone else. She has her husband. Okay. Why else? 
in the 1940s, I think it was, a guy named Denis, or Dennis if you want, de Rougemont, wrote a book called Love in the Western World. In which he said, which his central thesis was, this is the element of love. This is the basis of love in the Western world. It's misery and bliss. It's pain and pleasure. He bases it upon the great love stories of the Western world. Tristan and Isolde. Not a happy ending. Lancelot and Guinevere. Not a happy ending. And he is in Dido, not a happy ending. Romeo and Juliet, not a happy ending. Antony and Cleopatra, not, notice how many of these also are in Shakespeare. Not a happy ending. Okay? Orpheus and Eurydice. Okay? I mean, we go back to the ancient Greeks for this. To some extent, until he comes back at least, Odysseus and Penelope. Okay? Every one of these, Pyramus and Thisbe, ends up with what? Dead, my dove? You know, Shakespeare's. My son auditioned for the uh, Shakespeare in the park for the summer, got a role, and they had him read for the character for flute who plays Thisbe. I'm just praying that he gets the part, because it'll be so funny if he does. Okay? His point is, it is... Pure, unadulterated joy, and at the same time, <coughs> pure, unadulterated pain. Right. Why? Because many of those love affairs that we just discussed were what? Adulterous. That's the courtly love tradition. Okay? Adultery is at the heart of that. Well, They've not, quote unquote, done the deed, but to some groups, this is real borderline adultery, what's going on, okay? So, they talk of love's misery and bliss. I would learn from you, sir, said that gentle lady, if the question was not irksome, what the reason was that someone as young and valiant as yourself, courteous, chivalrous, as you were known far and wide, blah, 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 blah. For to speak of um, how, she says, why aren't you doing more? 1520. You are the outstanding knight of your time. Your fame and your honor are known everywhere. And I've sat by you here now on two separate occasions. But I haven't heard a solitary word from you about any love. In other words, she's saying what? So are you with someone? Is there someone back at Camelot? And you, who make such courteous and elegant vows, should be eager to instruct a youthful creature. Teach her some elements of skill and true love. Are you ignorant to enjoy such great fame, or do you think me too silly to take in courtly chat? In other words, teach me the ways of love. That's what she's asking. Everybody knows you know what to do. You know how to speak. This was the art of conversation. The art of love. Andres Capolanos translated from Horace's satire. Uh, uh, Ovid's satire. And he says, now, let me finish what she says first. Or do you think me too silly to take in courtly chat? For shame, I come here alone and sit to learn your special play. <laughs> I'm not even going to touch that one. Show me your expertise while my husband is away. Teach me. In good faith, it gives me, well, in good faith, may God reward you. May God show you about true love. It gives me great gladness, pleases me hugely that one as noble as yourself should make your way here, trouble yourself with a nobody, with any kind of favor. It gives me delight, but to take the task of myself of explaining true love and treat the matter of romance and chivalric tales to you, 
whom I know well have more expertise in that subject by half than a hundred such men as myself ever can, however long I may live, would be absolute folly. What has he just said to her in very courteous, flowery language? No, it's not that. Why? No? Turn that around, Christina. Don't make it about him, make it about her. Just the opposite. Who know, he says, who have more expertise in that subject by half than a hundred such men. Oh. <laughs> Me teach you? Oh. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you who know more about love than 150 men? He's not saying she's been with 150 men. He's just saying... Honey, you wrote the book, The Joy of Sex. I've merely read the blurb on the back, you know. He said, I can't teach you anything. Believe me. It would be folly, foolishness. But notice, he doesn't shut up. <laughs> he takes that shovel and he just digs deeper and deeper. I will carry out your desires with all my power. As I am in all duty bound and always will be the servant of your wishes, God preserve me. I am here. Your husband's gone. We're alone. I'm yours. Help me, God. <laughs> Thus that lady, and this is the first time we're told this, by the narrator. Again, this is a reliable narrator. This, the narrator is telling us the truth. Made trial of him. She is trying, proving him, testing his metal, M-E-T-T-L-E, not M-E-D-A-L, or M-E-T-A-L. Tempting him many times to have led him into mischief, whatever her purpose. What does the whatever her purpose mean? Okay, we're told she makes trial she tempts him. She tries to lead him into mischief. <clears throat> Those are three things. But then, whatever her purpose. Doesn't, isn't purpose important? No. It's extremely important. It can't be real temptation unless the intent is there for him to fall into that temptation, for him to succumb to that temptation, to him to actually have sex with her right there, right there. So, is the temptation merely to get him to stumble? Or is it to go all the way, you know, head up, over heels, down the stairs, so to speak? But he defended himself so skillfully that no fault appeared, nor evil on either side. Okay, so the narrator's telling us she's not evil. She's not intending evil. Because if she were intending evil, then she would be evil. Nor anything did they feel but delight. They've not crossed over into what? Sin. This is like proverbially Adam and Eve in the garden, they see the tree, the serpent speaks to Eve, she thinks, but she doesn't eat. At least not yet. They've, she's not crossed the line. Neither of them here have crossed the line. They laughed and bantered long. She kissed her guest, charmingly took her leave, and goes. Okay. He gets a kiss, he gets a bore. What's the symbolism? These two, completely innocent. I mean, the deer, you can't say a deer is guilty of anything. The deer is innocent, okay? The boar, however, <laughs> that's a lot more dangerous. Okay. He's not, it's aggressive. He's not evil. But he's not evil. 
In other words, the temptation that goes on this day is what? A bit more aggressive. Okay, it's a bit more aggressive. What else? It's closer to adultery. Knife's edge. I mean, if he falls here, this is going to be a real fall. This isn't going to be a little slipping, you know, like an alcoholic having one sip. <laughs> no, this is going to be a fifth of scotch followed by a quart of, you know. Okay. So, the knight comes back. He gives Sir Gallen the meat from the boar. And Sir Gallen says... 10, uh, 1637 and following, and I'll give you what I found. Plants another kiss on him. And so the knight says, after a bit of talking and feasting and such, 1673, as I am an honest man, I give you my word, you shall reach the Green Chapel to settle your affairs, dear sir, on New Year's Day well before nine. Therefore, lie in your bed, enjoying your case, your ease, and I'll go hunt again. And we'll do the, we'll do it again. Exchange winnings, for I've tested you twice and find you trustworthy. But tomorrow, <coughs> remember, best throw third time. In other words, third time's a charm. Come on, let's see if you can stay faithful. So, he goes off, hunts a fox. She comes in, and we're told, 1750, when she comes in, in the stupor of a dream, that nobleman muttered, like a man overburdened with troublesome thoughts, how destiny would deal with him his fate on the day when he meets the man at the Green Chapel, and must stand the return blow. But he hears her voice, and she wakens him from this dream. Right? So what's in his mind? The green knight. I'm dead. I'm tomorrow. I'm gonna die. That's it. That's, I'm gonna die. She comes in. They talk about sex, kind of, right? I mean, obliquely, in a paraphrastic way. That is, they walk around it, but actually going. And she gets ready to leave. We're told 1770. For that noble lady, so con then let me back up. He sees her. I gotta back up a lot. She comes in. He welcomes her 1759 with charming demeanor. Seeing her so radiant, attractively dressed, every part of her so perfect and color so fine, hot, passionate feeling, <laughs> welled up in his heart, probably other places too. Smiling gently and courteously, they make playful speech so that all that passed between them was happiness. Joy and delight. Notice, no sinful thoughts, no sinful talk, just gracious words they spoke, and pleasure reached its height, great peril threatened, should Mary not mind her night. That is, he's lost if Mary doesn't remember him, not if he doesn't remember her. And I don't know, you know, it'd be fun to film this, because you can have Sir Gallon in the bed, you know, he can pull the curtains back when she comes in, and there, on a mannequin, over against the wall, is his armor and everything, and his shield is facing the wall, so the pentagon goes up against the wall, and he can look, oh, and there's Mary, watching everything that goes on, because of the icon. That would kind of help keep him on the straight and narrow. For that noble lady so constantly pressed, pushed him so close to the verge. What's the verge? The abyss. <laughs> that either he must take her love there and then or churlishly reject it. That is, like a churl, not like a courteous knight. A churl would say, get out of here, you slut. Can't do that though. <laughs> so he felt concerned for good manners, lest he behave like a boor, and still more lest he shame himself by an act of sin. Notice he's stuck. He has to live up to the reputation and to the manners of court, but if he does, 
you will fall into sin. And he thinks to himself, God forbid. So she says to him, you deserve rebuke if you feel no love for the person you are lying beside more than anyone on earth wounded in her heart, unless you have a mistress. So she kind of presses him. I get it. There's somebody you love. You've plied a trough with that lady. He says, by St. John. Why St. John? St. John, the beloved of Christ. In truth, I have no one. Nor seek one for this while. Nope. Single. Not looking either. Now, the not looking, you could take that as being his rejection of her. She says, that remark is the worst you could make. So you're rejecting me for no one. It'd be one thing if there was somebody. But I've answered, indeed, and painfully. Kiss me now lovingly, and I'll go. You know, her life is ruined, she says. I must spend my life grieving as a woman deeply in love. And he's like, you got your husband. And she's like, yeah, but he's like a blind, bald, fat cripple compared to you. <laughs> she moves away and says, now do me this kindness at parting. Give me something, something to remind you of, to remind me of you. A token, a gift. He says, I, I, I don't have anything. I'm reaching for a hanky. I don't even have a hanky, you know, nothing. But to give you as a love token something worth little would do you no honor to have at this time a glove for a keepsake. Keepsake as going, if I were going to give you something, it would have to be something really worth something. But I don't have anything like that here. Okay. She goes, no, most honored sir, though I get no gift from you, you shall have one from me. Something to remind you of me. And she holds out a ring. Sparkling jewel, worth enormous stuff. He's, I, I don't want any gifts. Not at this time. What's he thinking? Partially at least. Okay, I got to do that. I think it's even more basic than that. Yeah, I'm going to, you know, it's all going to go underground. So she presses him. He declines her request. Okay, so you won't take my ring because you think it's too precious. Freudian symbolism there, by the way. He wouldn't take her ring, her circle, before. So he won't take this one. She says, okay, let me give you my girdle. Goes around the waist. <laughs> Faith, her privates, we, you know, Rosencrantz and Gildenstern mm -hmm. stay, stay in Hamlet. He says, I, I can't. She goes, but if you knew what this thing did, then you would. Well, what does it do? Well, the man who wears this can't be killed. Okay, that I can take. <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you. Okay. 1846. Now do you refuse this belt because it is worth little? So truly it appears. It is indeed a trifle worth even less, but anyone who knew the power woven into it would put a much higher price on it. There is no man on earth who can strike him down, for he cannot be killed by any trick in the world. Then the knight reflected, flashed into his mind, big green guy, axe. Yes, I'll take it. She leaves. Where does he go immediately after that? He goes to church. For what purpose? To say confession. He says confession, okay? We're told. He confessed himself, like 1880, honestly admitted his sin, put the great and small forgiveness begs, calls on the priest for absolution. Priest absolves him completely. That is, if he were to die the next moment, he would die free of sin, boom, straight to heaven. Okay? Here's a question. Does Sir Gowan tell the priest what he's thinking? <clears throat> he confesses his sins. What sin is he thinking of that he hasn't yet done? Adultery. Nope. 
No. What's the sin he's thinking of? What must he do with that girl? Well, not give it back. He's got to give it to the knight. Because uh, what's he thinking? I wear this girdle. I'll survive. I'll survive. You know, hear the survivor song, the Rocky song. You know, I will survive. So he's thinking. He must be thinking. I think at this point, I'm not going to tell. I'm not going to give this away. I give this away at Adam World. I keep it. I lie tonight. I live tomorrow. He's doing some cold war calculus in his mind. Live is better than death. Okay. Is that a sin? Uh, it's unchivalrous. It's unchivalrous. He's planning to sin, but he hasn't sinned yet. Well, it's, I mean, like, it's not I mean, necessarily. Isn't it, isn't it like a sin to like premeditate a sin? Well, it's, this is premeditated, I mean, but he hasn't done it yet. That's my point. Does he need to confess a sin he's thinking about doing, but he hasn't done yet? You can't. According to Catholic doctrine, you can't confess a sin you've not yet done. Why? You've not yet done it. It's not yet a sin. It's not yet a stain. Once you do it, then it's a sin. Then that block gets put on your balance, you know, for oops. <laughs> so he doesn't have to confess it yet. Okay? He could confess it after he he could go to church after he doesn't give it up. Because the night comes, the Lord gives him the fox, and so now he has a nice red fox pelt to wear on his way to get slaughtered. And he gives the night a kiss. Next morning, he goes off. He gets led by, I know we've only got a couple minutes. He gets led by the porter to, uh, this is in fit four, to the chapel. And the porter tells him, don't go. Don't go. It'll be a waste. You will be, your death will be a waste. Don't go. The guy's the devil. Tell you what, I'll tell everybody you went, I'll go back home, you go home by another way. It's your guy's like, good God, man, you want me to lie? <laughs> well, you already have. <laughs> he says, I, I, I have to do this. Okay. We'll, um, we will pick up with, let's see here. Around 2150, I think on whatever the day that is, Tuesday. And we'll finish this relatively quickly.